Well, good morning, Trinity Anglican. Good morning. And good morning to those who are joining us online or live stream. We're glad you're with us. It's a joy to fill in for uh, our pastors who are away. And Pastor Tim, when I talked to him about um, uh, filling in, I said, do you mind if I break from the Summer for Psalms series? And he gave me permission to go in a different direction. So I'm going to do just that. Um, I want to talk to you this morning about a part of our worship service every week, uh, the preaching. And I can do that since Pastor Tim is not here as well. So, uh, But each week we get a sermon. And if you don't belong to Trinity Anglican, you go to another church, chances are you do too. Uh, we have here the liturgy. We have the time of singing praise to God, time of prayer, uh, time gathering around the Lord's table. We read the scriptures, but there's always a sermon. So what is that about? Why do we do it? Have you ever thought about it deeply? I, I want us to go to the scriptures to get a better understanding of, of, of that part of worship. I think it's one of the most misunderstood parts of worship today. In a lot of churches, when you hear people talk about the service, they'll say, well, we'll have our worship time and then the preaching. The preaching is something extraneous. Here at uh, Trinity Anglican and Anglicans in general, they thankfully look at preaching as part of the worship service. But I have to say a lot of Anglicans, because uh, it's such a deep tradition, they're not sure why they, they do it because we've always done it that way. Or, you know, it's, we can't actually tell you why we must do it. That's what I want to focus on. My title is Why proclaim the word of God? Why proclaim? Why do we have to do this? Why should we do this? Why must we do this? So if you have a Bible with you, I'd like you to use it this morning. I'd like you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And I want to focus on two principal reasons for preaching. And then I want to add to that a warning that is given by Paul to Timothy, and then add my own just helpful applications to sum it up. So two reasons for preaching, a warning that Paul gives to Timothy, and then some practical, helpful application. Second Timothy, it's a small little letter. It's from the Apostle Paul to his apprentice, a young guy named Timothy. And Paul couldn't be at Ephesus anymore, so he appointed people to pastor his churches that he planted, like Titus and Timothy. And Timothy is a young pastor, uh, probably younger than our Timothy, Pastor Tim. And he's intimidated by the assignment that, he's, that he has. He's in this massive city, uh, intellectual center, and he's shepherding a, a church, and it's a counterculture church. He is um, called by Paul in this letter in 1 Timothy to be faithful because he's tempted to shrink back. Have you ever been tempted to shrink back from being a Christian? He's tempted to shrink back. And Paul wants him to endure and to endure hardship and to stay godly and to do things like fulfill your ministry and please, Timothy, preach the word. That was the charge that Paul gave to Timothy. And the question I want to ask is why? I want to try to answer it with you from God's word. So reason number one, are you ready? Why do we preach? Why bother with this exercise uh, on Sunday mornings? Reason number one is because God has spoken. We believe God has spoken. You go to chapter 3, verse 14. Paul writes, as for you, Timothy, continue in what you've learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you've learned it, how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, let's just think about that. One reason we preach is because God is a talking God. What is the origin of the Bible? Well, uh, the, 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 the origin is God. God wonderfully doesn't play charades with the universe. You ever play the game charades? Does anybody know that game? Does anybody play it anymore? We used to play it at Christmas time, and it was a, you start out, one person stands up in front of everybody, and you go, 
He can't talk, but he has to send a message. So is it a book? Is it a song? And you can't say these words. Is it a movie? And the people have to guess what you're trying to refer to. Is it books, a famous book, song, or movie? God didn't do that. God created the world and then he spoke. He spoke it into existence, but then he revealed himself by sending his son and by giving us the scriptures so that we can know the mind of God. We have special revelation from him. We have general revelation. The heavens declare the glory of God, but that doesn't tell us a lot of things. Like how do we deal with our sin and our lostness and meaning? And that's where the Bible gives us special knowledge of who God is. And so he writes to Timothy, all scripture is God breathed. What does he refer to? Well, first of all, of course, the Old Testament, but also the New Testament. Because by this time, they knew that the words of Jesus were the fulfillment of the Old Testament. By this time, Paul was sometimes referring to his own writings and say they should be read along with the Old Testament. He called his message the word of God. Peter regarded Paul's letters as, as scripture. So all scripture is breathed out by God. By the way, some of your translations have it. They're, all scripture is inspired by God. And they're both okay translations. Inspired, you know, tells us that it's a very unique writing. But it's, that, that translation has limitations. And I'll tell you why. Because you might have a favorite book. Say it's one of my favorite books books is the Chronicles of Narnia. Now, some of you are big Tolkien fans, and you say, that's inspiring when I read it. Well, so the Bible is inspiring. It's special. But Paul goes further here. It's not just inspiring. Th this word is breathed out by God. Literally, it's expired. It comes from the mind and heart of God. It is God speaking. We have the word of God through the words of people where he, in using the Holy Spirit, worked through the personalities and the disciplines and the research and the collection of those who are writing it so that his message came through them accurately. All scripture is breathed out by God. It's breathed out by God. And that makes this book not just inspiring, but a one-of-a-kind book that we have to set apart and take seriously. Do you take the Bible that seriously? I remember watching the coronation of Charles III in May. Did anybody watch that? I just want to, I'm just curious, the two people that watched it in this room. Oh, more than two. Okay, good. It, it was fascinating. And did you catch part of the coronation service in England is where the moderator of the Church of Scotland hands a Bible to the new monarch they did this to the Queen Elizabeth, to Charles III, and all the Charles before him. And the ch moderator of the Church of Scotland gives him the Bible as part of the investiture and says, this book is the most valuable thing the world affords. Here is wisdom, the royal law. These are the lively oracles of God, an inestimable treasure. I mean, those are powerful words. Whether they believed them or not, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that what the moderator said is true. This book is unique because God has spoken through his prophets by the Holy Spirit so that we have an accurate word. And that's why we call it the word of God. Or we call it the Holy Bible. Holy means it's, it's unique. No other book like it. It's totally unique. Again, I'll ask you, do you believe that? In our liturgy every week, we have responses to the scripture readings. You know, praise to you, O Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The people say, thank you very much. Thanks be to God, right? It's not just Anglicans who do that, by the way. I've heard Baptists even do that. And uh, Presbyterians do that. I'm a Presbyterian back by background. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an affirmation that this is... This is unique. By the way, there are some churches. Um, I heard about an Episcopal church in New Jersey with a very liberal bishop. And he said, this is not the word of God. These are just first century ramblings of, of somebody. We don't have to take it seriously. You don't have to obey its commands. I was at a Presbyterian church, a very liberal Presbyterian church. And they don't say this is the word of God. They say, listen for the word of God. Like maybe in the midst of all these writings, you'll hear something that 
It sounds like it's from God. Not, not too hopeful. But in, in Bible-believing, gospel-believing, orthodox churches, you say more than that. You say, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That means we take it seriously. Why? Because it's from God. And we preach because God has spoken so that we might know his book. And the purpose of his book is quite plainly stated in verse 15. Look at verse 15. He said, Timothy, you've been acquainted with the scriptures from childhood. These sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Just park on that for a second. Do you ever wonder what the theme of the entire Bible is? If somebody asked you at work, say, what is the Bible about? Could you tell them in, in a sentence? There it is. That's the theme of the Bible. Salvation through faith in the Messiah Jesus. That's the theme that, that's the gospel that ties the whole Bible together. It's amazing. The Bible is a salvation book. Salvation comes through Christ and his atoning death on the cross and his resurrection. And it's by faith in Christ that our hearts are opened up and our sins are forgiven. So that's the purpose of this book that we preach, that God has spoken. And then we learn one other thing, that it's profitable. Oh my, it's not just a, another book. I have so many books in my house. You go to my study, I have so many books. When I move, it's a real royal pain because I got so many books to move. And as I get older, it's not good for my back. <laughs> They're heavy. Um, but uh, this is a one-of-a-kind book. This is a profitable book because it is God-breathed. It comes from God. It points to Christ. It's there to help us. It's our means of growing in him. Why do we have quiet time? Why do we go to Bible studies? Why do we, maybe some of us have family Bible reading? Why do we have the ministry of preaching in a church? Because we need God's word, that's why. And when we read it, it's profitable because it's not just another word, it's God's word. And whether we're broken and we sense our brokenness or we're lost, we need something to give us light. And the unfolding of your word, as Psalm 119 says, is what gives us light. So why do we preach? We preach, first of all, because God has spoken. We have a word from our creator. Isn't that worth giving praise and thanks to God for this morning? We're not left in the dark. That's good news. Somebody say amen. I know we're Anglicans, but yeah, that's okay. Um, second reason why we proclaim the word of God because God commands us to. Look at chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. So I charge you, Paul writing, I charge you, Timothy, in the presence of God and Christ Jesus. Now remember, Paul's in Rome, in prison, ready to put his life on the line and die. And so he's not messing around. Timothy, sober up. He's going to judge the living and the dead. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and careful teaching. Timothy, that's your job. So we preach, secondly, because God commands us to. The pastor has to take that command very, very seriously. Timothy had to, too. And Timothy was a little bit, um, uh, shall we say, intimidated by the culture. Because the culture at that time, much like ours, didn't really believe in truth didn't really take truth seriously. They were a little bit resistant to this idea of preaching anything that claimed to be true for absolutely everybody. And Paul wanted Timothy to be unashamed, to be strong. And he knew that by preaching, the church is built up. It's one of the instruments of grace, the means of grace, the God-ordained instruments to grow you and me as believers. Uh, so he says, preach the word. Now, I find it helpful at this point to uh, remember together that um, preaching had a special place. As you read the Old Testament, it has a very special place. As you read the New Testament, it also has a special place. Well, what do I mean? Well, consider a passage in Deuteronomy. If you have a Bible, turn to Deuteronomy 18. 
Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. Moses is preaching, giving God's word right before Israel goes into the promised land. Here's their last attempt to hear from Moses. And this is what he writes. The Lord your God, verse 15, Deuteronomy 18, will raise up a prophet like me from among you. Remember, Moses isn't going over with them. From your brothers, listen to him, just as you desired of the Lord, your God, at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they've spoken. So I will raise up for them a prophet like you, Moses, from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. Now, what, what's God saying? He's saying the people couldn't take the naked word of God to their ears. They were ruined when they heard it. Remember in Exodus, uh, when God gave the Ten Commandments, and... Um, they heard thunder, and they saw flashes of lightning, and they saw the mountain smoking. It says they were afraid, they trembled, they stood far off, and they said to Moses, Moses, you speak to us, we'll listen, but do not let God speak lest we die. So sometimes we get this silly notion in our head, like, oh, if only I could hear the voice of God, if I could only, my eyes could see him as he is, then I would believe and I would be on fire as a believer. And we say these silly things. The truth from a biblical perspective is, if you were to see God in his holiness, you would be undone and ruined. You couldn't take it. If you were to hear the naked voice of the tri three times holy God, you would, you would unravel. So, because God is so holy and we are so frail, God in his mercy says, I know what I'll do. I'll give them a prophet. I'll give them a middleman, a spokesman. I'll put my word in his mouth. He'll speak and they'll be able to hear. They won't be ruined by hearing him. They'll be able to take it and they'll be able to learn of reality and truth and of me. See, that's the Old Testament view of preaching and what a prophet did. It was a, preaching was a mercy gift by a holy God to a sinful people so that they could make sense of reality. You know, and then you go to the New Testament and the New Testament has a special place for preaching. It builds on that, of course. What does Jesus do when he starts ministering? Matthew 4, from that time on, he began to preach. He appoints 12 apostles. What do they do? Well, they're with him. He sends them out to preach and drive out demons. Uh, he tells them the gospel is going to be preached by you to all the nations. Wow. The early church, they've got a, a distribution problem. He says, make sure people are cared for, but don't neglect the preaching of the word. And so um, the apostles appoint deacons so that the word of God can still go out. Romans 10, how can anyone hear unless they, um, without someone preaching to them? How can they preach unless they're sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? I mean, this is, this is the high place of preaching that the scriptures talk about. Uh, Paul himself says, I was appointed apostle and as a preacher and a teacher. And he tells Timothy, you are too. So buddy, preach the word. Why do we preach every Sunday? Why proclaim the word of God? Because secondly, God has commanded it. And a faithful pastor's got to obey and a faithful church must obey. And there must be some good sense behind it. We need the word. The word is all of scripture, which includes the gospel pointing to the cross and the resurrection of Christ. Focus on the Lord Jesus himself, the living word. Preach the word of God. That's why we preach. Now, it's hard to find a definition of preaching in the Bible. A definition, right? Maybe the one word definition, the best one is a herald. One who proclaims good news. Uh, the, one definition I heard when I was just starting out as a pastor was by a man named Phillips Brooks, who was a New England pastor. And he, he said, preaching is it's God's truth mediated through human personality proclaimed announcing the good news. And that, that was helpful to me as a young pastor. 
I remember hearing John Stott say, John Stott was a very important Anglican evangelical leader. He had a big influence on the founding of this movement that we're a part of. He said, to preach is to open up the inspired text with such faithfulness and sensitivity that God's voice is heard and God's people obey him. That's good too. J.I. Packer, another one of these great English Anglicans who wrote, the, actually helped write the catechism for the Anglican Church of North America. He says, preaching is an activity that lets texts, biblical texts, talk. You hear sometimes we talk about expository preaching. That means a message that emerges from the Bible and explains the Bible. Now, that means a pastor's job is not to, quote, wing it. Right? Sometimes my congregation, I was a pastor for 22 years, they, they, um, they probably heard a sermon that I gave and they said, it sounds like he, he was winging it. Now, like, not much preparation in that one. Or sometimes I've heard someone say to me, you know, can't you just pull, a, pull one out of a hat like you pull a rabbit out of a hat? And I'm saying, it's not the way it works. It's not the way it's supposed to work. Or sometimes they have referred to uh, in the trade Saturday night specials. You know, yeah, you're too busy all week and you're just preparing at the last minute Saturday night. That's not the way it's supposed to work. What's to happen is the pastor is to seriously study and engage with the Word of God under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It involves a lot of work. It involves a lot of trained study. It involves a wrestling with the text intellectually, morally, letting it shape you. Dealing with your own soul, doing the heart work that you need to do uh, ahead of time. It involves praying it through and then thinking, how do I communicate and what do I communicate to the, sh to the flock that God has given me? I mean, it's a lot of work. Some of you here know exactly what I'm talking about. Howard, I'm looking at you, my friend, who is the pastor of Grace Church Lexington. And many years, you... You were involved in the labor of preaching. Brian, I know you've preached a good number of times, and you know what I'm talking about. Donald, I know you do too. Um, this, this is a holy, godly, important work. Uh, and we take God's command, we're supposed to take it seriously uh, when, we, when we prepare. So then comes the warning, and you find it in verses 3 to 5 of chapter 4. Let me read it for you. For the time is coming, Timothy, when people aren't going to endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they're going to accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They're, they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. So the time is coming, he says. Are we here? Are we, are we there? I think we're there. I think he felt he was there too. We're living in an age that's not taking this seriously. Um, paraphrasing Doug Grothuis and his book, Truth Decay, we're living in an age of truth decay, right? I think Timothy was too. Uh, people aren't going to endure truth. They're ever learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. They can't bear the truth. In our day, people are offended by if you talk about the very concept of truth. So they have itchy ears, which means they want novelty. Uh, they want, um, you know, entertain me, uh, give me something else. Um, and if I don't get it from the people up there, then we're going to bring our own teachers in who will give us the fluff that we want. And they will turn aside from the truth, it says, to myths. Why, is this happening today? Sure seems like it is. I mean, our times, uh, uh, ec this echoes in, in our age as I read it. Uh, we, we feel the, the pressure to move away from serious biblical teaching, the kind that Pastor Tim gives us week after week. Uh, today we hear people go, you know, who are you to tell me or tell anybody anything? Don't preach. Right? That comes across because we're all autonomous laws to ourselves. Papa, don't preach, the songs say. Don't tell me what to do, how to run my life. Just inspire us. I've preached at a lot of different churches, and, and some take the Bible seriously, some don't. 
I remember one Presbyterian church in Florida, they said, well, you know, just inspire us. I go, well, you want the Bible? Uh, well, not too much, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking, no, please. I remember going to another church the next week. It was an Acts 29 church, and they said, just give us, just give us the word. And I was thinking, oh, my goodness, what a contrast. What an interesting thing the church is right now. And so we need the word of God. God's word says we need the word of God. We preach because he commands us to. And um, part of our role is to encourage our pastors who are trying their best. They have good weeks, they have bad weeks like all of us, but they are trying to be faithful. And our job is to encourage them, just like Timothy, to fulfill their ministry and do so faithfully. I mean, this is God's charge to Tim and Kyle and anybody who stands in this pulpit. It's to proclaim the word of God. I hope you'll encourage your pastors. They need it. They don't get a lot of it. They need it. So I want to end with a very practical application. So what do we do? What, what should we do during a sermon as we're listening to it? And I'd like to give you what I think. These are not scripture. This is my suggestions after some years of pastoral experience and as a Christian who's groped along. Um, here are six practical things to, to do during a sermon, to get the most out of it or to do as you approach listening to a sermon on Sunday and to your worship. Number one, faithfully attend a church where the word of God is preached. So if you're visiting today, this is a church like that. If you're looking for a church, find a church like that. Not every church believes that God has spoken and the Bible is God's word. Faithfully attend a church where the word is preached. That means be careful about sporadic church going. I saw a poll recently that said the average church goer goes two Sundays a month. So it's down. And from a pastor's perspective, we think, oh my goodness, I'm preaching through, let's say, Colossians or the Psalms and they're missing half of it. They're missing the, the word of God as I want to unfold it because I know them really well. So be careful about sporadically attending a church and attend one where the word is preached. Number two, if you want to get the most out of a sermon, come with a ready, receptive heart and mind. A good preparation begins on Saturdays, not on Sunday morning, 10 minutes before you go. It means you try to organize your life a little bit. Um, if you have young children, it's much harder. Um, it means if you're older, you try to get a good night's sleep so you don't nod off. Uh, if you have a lot of kids, it means you're going to be fighting a battle on Sunday morning. You know it, and it's going to be hard, and you may get no sleep the night before. But have a plan. Have a battle plan for, for Sundays so that the enemy won't take advantage of just chaos and, you know, because he does. So come with a ready heart and mind so that your ears are open and your heart is ready to receive what God has for you. Number three, BYOB. What does that stand for? Bring your own, Bring your own Bible. <laughs> Bring your own Bible. Now, why do I say that? I know you have the scriptures on the phone. I do too. It's very convenient. I know there are pew Bibles here. Those are backups. The advantage of having your Bible with you is, I mean, a physical Bible is that as you open it, you get to know it better. You get to know the passages that he's directing you to. You not only hear the word, you see the word. You have two senses engaged. So you take more in when you have a physical Bible. Christians have been called people of the book. Where's the book? Uh, this is the sword of the spirit. Where's the sword? Can you imagine a Roman soldier going out to battle and he's got all the armor, but he's left his sword at home? Like he would be tossed out. But that's, that's, like, that's a picture of a Christian. Um, Paul writes in Ephesians 6, you know, put on the armor of God, all of it, and don't forget the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So don't ignore your Bible. Try bringing it to church. Follow along. Let it become more a part of your life. Number four, take notes. I remember when I was a new college student, freshman year, I had a history prof. 
And he started his lecture, and I had my books closed, my notebook closed, my pen wasn't out. And he looked at me, and he said, oh, I see some of you have the gift of total recall. <laughs> and I thought, okay. Um, well, I knew I didn't have the gift of total recall. Uh, I don't have that great a memory, didn't then. Um, and, and he said, no, open a book and write it down. I'm going to test you on it. This is important. Now, you won't be tested on what happens on Sunday morning, but there's truth to the fact that the shortest pencil is longer than the longest memory. When you write it down, you remember. You remember the text you were in, the, the key points, the application, you, you, what you're to do, because there's pointed application in every sermon that Pastor Tim or Kyle give. What should you change? What relationship should you fix? What action should you take? What one thing should you take into the week? If you're not taking note, how do you remember? How do you remember? Which takes me to application point number five. Uh, it's, a good, it's just a suggestion, but get a sermon notebook. Get a sermon notebook. And use that to take a note. Bring it with your Bible. So this is mine. Um, it's a moleskin book. It's a five by eight. And I bring it with me Sunday along with my Bible. And I write down, I've got a record of just about every Sunday since last September. Um, generally what was preached, the text that was preached. And then I have a page where I took some scribbled notes. Um, sometimes there's a lot. Sometimes there's a little. And some are circled like, Go back to this. You want to remember this. God wants you to hear this again. And, uh, and then at the end of the year, I take it and I go through it and I go, Lord, how in the world, what, what do you want to do in my life? Uh, how can I fulfill your will? What do you want to change in me? And I, I go back and, and I can see ways that God has spoken to me through his word. But if you don't have something, some record of it, how, how are you going to track how God is forming you as a believer? So you might have a better way, but this is my little pathetic sermon notes 2022 to 2023 at Trinity Anglican Church. It's my pathetic attempt to try to, A, remember names of people I meet, and B, remember what God has said through the preaching of his word. It might help. And then number six, explore the sermon. If you want to get a lot out of a sermon it helps if you have notes to remember, but uh, that's a phrase that was used by early American and English Puritans where they would hear the sermon, go to worship, and then they'd go home and during a mealtime or sometime during the week, they would rehearse like, well, what was the sermon about? How did God speak to you through his word this Sunday? And they would share uh, and they would explore like, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And drive it more deeply into your hearts. Well, these are just six little disciplines for hearing that might help you, that might take you to the next level. But all of it is meant to help you receive the word of God that is proclaimed. Look, friends, we are approaching a new ministry year, which a lot of churches, they say, starts in September. Back to school, we're in a new track, we go through the fall, we go through Advent, Christmas, we go through Lent, Holy Week, we get into the spring, we get to Pentecost, we take our breaks for summer, and we start all over again. What an opportune time to think about encouraging our pastors to fulfill their ministry of the word. And what an opportune time to think about our habits in receiving the word. And what an opportune time to thank God for the mercy the gift of preaching the word of God. Because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for being a God who speaks. You don't play charades with the world. We thank you that you have given us the living word, Jesus Christ, who is incarnate and lived righteously among us and died an atoning death for our sins, and rose again, and has ascended, and reigns as is coming again. And we thank you for giving us the written word of God, Scripture, this special revelation to be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Help us, Lord, to be people of the book, to be people who are deeply rooted in your word, 
We pray your blessing upon our shepherds as they teach us and prepare for a new season. And all of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.